so fun to be with you guys. I got to tell you, this might be one of my favorite cities in the world. So I love it. So as Trish said, I spent 20 years, almost 20 years as a sports agent and worked with some unbelievable athletes and coaches and broadcasters. And I loved every minute of it because it's a business that's focused on peak performers. And it's a business where there's more agents than there are athletes to represent. Bad business model, right? Tell your kids that want to be sports agents. So it's incredibly competitive. So relationships are an integral part, certainly, of our ability to be successful. As Trisha said, I have a book coming out this April called Fearless at Work. And that's what I want to talk about today is how do we, you as leaders inside your organization who are integral in creating a culture inside your organization, lead in the way that we behave in our mindset as it relates to curiosity, as it relates to resilience, as it relates to boldness. So when we think about being fearless at work, when we think about being at, at the very least the best version of ourselves each and every day, I think it starts with being curious. And so I'll tell you about a guy that I've worked with for years, John Smoltz. And many of you know Smoltz, right? John was a right-handed pitcher for the Atlanta Braves for years. And Smoltz was a guy that every four or five days he would go out on the mound and he would throw 80 or 90 pitches. And then he would sit down. And four or five days later, he'd do it again. And four or five days later, he'd do it again. That was John's world. He was a starter and he was amazing as a starter. It was what he stood for. It's what the organization leaned on him for. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in my office one day in the Braves call. Hey, Molly, listen, do you think Smoltz would consider stepping into the role of closer next season? In other words, right, do you think he would consider stepping into the role of stepping into the game at the end of the game with only, you know, in a tight game, a 2-1 game, and throw two to three to five pitches? And maybe the next day he throws again. And the next day he pitches again. So going from four to five days of a break to now pitching possibly every day with a different kind of structure, that's a lot of change. So they say to John and me, would you consider it? Would you consider making this change? So I call Smoltz up and I said, hey man, listen, I got an interesting phone call today. The Braves want to know if you'll step into the role of closer. What do you think? And of course, like I said, this was a big shift. And John, by the way, was a guy <coughs> excuse me, that slept in a hyperbaric chamber in between starts so that, God, I have like this <coughs> tickle in my throat. <coughs> this isn't good. Sorry. <coughs> he slept. I'm going to pause so I can get this right. There we go. I think I got it, but thank you. Oh, I am so sorry. So Smoltzy, this was a really big change for John. So John comes up to the office and I said, what do you think? And by the way, Smoltzy slept in a hyperbaric chamber in between starts so that he could maximize the oxygen flow to his body. And I said to John once, I said, listen, man, you're married. So every once in a while, come out of a hyperbaric chamber. You know what I'm saying? Take care of Diane. And then, he, and then he comes up one day and he's like, Molly, I'm, I'm getting a divorce. And I'm like, I know, man. I told you. I warned you. <laughs> <coughs> so John was really rhythmic about the way he approached pitching, for sure. So this was a big shift. So we begin to process this. We take two or three days. John decides to step into the role of closer. He was curious about what it would lead to. He was curious about how it would allow him to contribute to the organization in, a, in another way. He was curious, most importantly, about the ability to allow him to grow. He was curious about the way in which it might allow him to serve the organization and his teammates even better. John was curious. He stepped into the role of closer the following season and led the National League in saves with 55 saves. <coughs> Smoltzy went into the Hall of Fame last summer as not just one of the best starters, but one of the best closers to ever pitch in the big leagues. So when we think about being fearless at work, when we think about being amazing leaders, when we think about the culture that we create, to me it starts at the core with curiosity. It starts with the opportunity to recognize that change equals growth. That change equals growth. The other piece that I think is imperative when we think about being fearless is taking ownership. So I'll tell you about a mistake that I made, and I love to tell this story because I hope it helps you 
not make the same one. Billy Donovan comes to us and wants us to represent him. And Billy Donovan, many of you may know now, is in the NBA. <coughs> this is crazy. I'm super healthy, I promise. I mean, I had my wheatgrass this morning, my Splorina Corella pills. I mean, I'm locked in. So, thanks for bearing with me. <coughs> so, Billy Donovan comes to us and he says, listen, I want to go to the NBA, so I want you guys to represent me because we had represented lots of NBA coaches. So we felt like we could take this opportunity on for him, and we felt like this would be a nice shift. Billy at the time, of course, had had great success at Florida as the men's basketball coach. He'd won national championships. He was a stud, right? So we look at Billy and we say, well, Billy, I mean, you've had great success at the college level, so any NBA job, we need to interview that NBA team as much as they're going to interview you. We need to make sure it's the right fit. And of course, Billy agreed. A couple months later, we get word that the Orlando Magic job is going to open up. And of course, we had actually negotiated every contract with the Magic since the team's inception. So we knew the team really well. We called Billy up. We said, Billy, we think this Magic's job is going to open up. What do you think? Billy said, wow, you know what? That's an interesting job. He said, I'm really interested in that. We said, great. So we called them the Florida, the AD at Florida, the athletic director at Florida, we get the blessing that we can call the Magic and begin to sort of explore this opportunity for Billy. We call the Magic. We begin to sort of walk them through our client list, and we said, look, we got a guy who's really interested in this job. We hear this job might open up, and they said, look, we're making this announcement tomorrow. Keep it under wraps. But yes, in fact, Billy is a guy that's top of our list. We said, great. The next day, the job officially opens up. We call the team back. They said, look, you know, we could play games with you, we could do all those things, but the truth is Billy's the top of our list. We said, great. So we start to negotiate all the terms of the deal, right? We negotiate the base salary, the bonuses, you know, any good agent, right? You got to get a couple, you know, maybe a country club, flights for the wife till they move, right? I mean, private schools for the kids, right? I mean, all that good stuff that agents do. So we do a great job and negotiate all the terms of the deal for Billy. We're going back and forth. It's, it's not a particularly complicated process, negotiating all the terms. Billy loves it. Billy feels great. We said, awesome. So we fly in from Atlanta. Billy flies in from Gainesville, where we're based. Billy flies from Gainesville, of course, where Florida is. We land, we get in a car, and we drive over to the arena to do a press conference. We sit in a boardroom. Billy signs about six original agreements. He executes all six. He signs them all. As I'm sitting in this boardroom, I look over on the other side of the boardroom table and there's a window. And on the other side of the window, down on the floor, is a basketball court. And all the media is there waiting to announce their new coach. So Billy finishes. We look down. I looked at Billy. I said, look at this. I said, all these guys, all these gals, all these reporters, you got to take care of all these guys. These are the same people that are going to cover you later. So we need to take care of them. Billy, of course, agrees. We get back. We walk down. Billy sits and does the press conference sort of on a stool and just does a terrific job. Super comfortable, confident, feels really at peace, just kills it. We're the last people to leave the gym. We get out, we get back in the car, we fly back to Atlanta, we fly, he flies back to Gainesville. We get back to Atlanta, we go, we took, it was like a Thursday night, we just made our client really happy, we took him to a new job that he was excited about. So we went to this amazing restaurant, we got a wonderful bottle of wine. We're halfway through the bottle of wine, and Billy calls and says, hey, listen, I want to bring one of my assistant coaches with me. <coughs> Excuse me. We said, great, Billy, you know, and he goes, look, would you call the team, and would you call him, and would you do that deal right now? We like referrals, sure. So we said, great. So we call Billy, or we call the team, we call the assistant coach, and we do that deal right then. So we ordered another bottle of wine, right? What the heck? So the next morning, the very next morning at 7.30 in the morning, I'm making breakfast for our three daughters. The phone rings. Billy calls. Hey, uh, listen, Molly, this is going to be a lot to take in, but I don't want that job. Never mind. I don't want to be the head coach at the Magic. I want to stay at Florida. You, you know, I have never, by the way, any time in my life wanted wine to go back. So bad, Right? But it was a moment when, of course, we took four or five days to make sure Billy was clear, to make sure that 
This was, in fact, a decision that he wanted to make, and he wanted to go back to Florida. But it was also a moment when I had to look inside myself and say, what did we do wrong? Here's a guy that said he wanted to go to the NBA that seems like a very intentional, calculated, very bright guy. And what was my role in this? It was an opportunity to say, boy, I could have probably done something different, and maybe we would have protected Billy from this embarrassing moment. And what I realized was I never, ever throughout the four or five days that we went through the negotiations of the contract, I never once asked Billy a really difficult question. The terms of the deal were great. The dollars, the bonuses, the clubs, the flights for the wife, all that was great. But never once did I look at Billy and say, hey, Billy, are you ready to look at those 18-year-old men who you recruited and looked at them in the eyes and said, I'm going to be your basketball coach and say, I'm out of here. I'm going to the NBA. Are you ready for that? Are you ready, Billy, to look at your athletic director at Florida who has had your back through the good and the bad and say, I'm out of here. I'm going to the NBA. Are you ready, Billy, if you get fired in two years, you're a young guy. What does that look like? Are you ready? It was a moment in which I realized that I played a very significant role in what happened. I think when we think about being fearless at work, it's about being accountable for the role that we play in each and everything that we do, right? When we want to lead, when we want to make change, taking ownership is obviously imperative. When we think about being fearless, I think that you can't be fearless unless you're resilient. You can't be fearless unless you recover fast. We're all going to have tough days. We're going to have tough meetings. We're going to have tough moments. I saw my athletes struggle, absolutely. But you know what I found? Oftentimes, it was right between the ears. When I'd see a baseball player that couldn't, couldn't hit, when I'd see a golfer that couldn't make a par, when I'd see a coach that couldn't motivate his guys, it was usually inside their mind. So what I find is that resiliency and our ability to recover fast is imperative. One of the guys that I had the opportunity to spend some time with is Butch Harmon. And Butch, some of you may know, is one of the best coaches out on the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour. He's worked with some of the best golfers in the world, Tiger, Annika, some special golfers. I was with him once and I said, hey, Butch, I said, Butch, you know, you've worked with the best top 10 golfers in the world, men and women. I said, Butch, what's the difference? What's the difference between the guys and gals out there that are one to 10 on the money list and everybody else? What's the difference? He didn't even hesitate. He said, the difference, the best of the best, they recover quickly from adversity. It's that simple. He said, Molly, the best golfers in the world, yeah, they're going to bogey a hole, no question. But you know what the best do? They par or they birdie the next one. I would challenge you when we lead our organizations, you guys are a powerful part, obviously, of creating the culture in the organizations. When we recover quickly, we send a message to the people around us, right, that we believe, that we believe in what we do and we believe in why we do it. Recovery to me is key. And then, of course, to be fearless at work, we've got to be bold. We've got to be bold. When we lead, when we create an environment, hopefully, that doesn't foster fear, but in fact fosters boldness, we can do some pretty magical things. So as Tricia said, you know, I graduated from Michigan State. I played tennis there, and I wanted to stay in the business of sports. But I was 22 years old and really had no money. And I looked at my mom and dad, and I said, listen, I think I want to move to Atlanta and see if I can find a job in sports. So they thought, well, this ought to be kind of interesting, you know? So I said, look, mom, I'm going to teach tennis all summer and save a little bit of money, and I'm going to take that money. I'm going to move down to Atlanta, live with a girlfriend of mine, and see if I can find a job. It'll give me, you know, maybe a month. She said, okay, that's fine. So I literally teach tennis all summer. I save 2000 bucks. I literally take $2,100 bills. I put them in my back pocket, and I backed out of my parents' driveway in my little Honda Accord, and, of course, my mom and dad looked at each other and went, don't even cry, honey. This is no big deal. She'll be back in two weeks, right? This is nothing. So I back out. I get down to Atlanta. I'm living on the floor of a high school friend of mine's little apartment. She said, Molly, you can live with me for a little bit, but this is a little one-bedroom apartment, and it's going to get tight fast. I said, oh, no, but if I can live with you for a minute, that'd be great. My college tennis coach gave me the names of three people in Atlanta that taught tennis. She said, Molly, in Atlanta, tennis is a really big deal. She said, in fact, people teach tennis for a reduced rate on their rent at apartment complexes. 
I said, really? I said, boy, you know, I've only got two grand, right? I mean, in a minute, I'm going to be eating grapes, you know, walking through the grocery store. So, boy, I could use a deal like that. You don't really have to wash them. I mean, I'm just saying. Maybe that's what happened to me today. So, I, I save, I get down to my friend's apartment and I call these three people in Atlanta that taught tennis. And I didn't want to be a tennis pro, but I thought, you know, I'll call them. And I had this philosophy that I believe so much. And in your roles, you can maybe tell this to, to young people. But I believe in life, when we ask for advice, we get a job. And when we ask for a job, we get advice. So I wake up that first morning, I call this tennis pro, and I'm asking him for advice, right? I'm trying to get a job in sports. And he says, you know, Molly, there's this deal. You should teach tennis for a little bit off your rent. You should find one. He goes, in fact, there's this amazing apartment complex, great location. They've had a tennis pro there for six years. He said, but I think he's getting married and he's moving out. He said, you ought to go over there and talk to that manager. I said, absolutely, right? I get in my little car. I drive over to the property. I walked into the manager. I said, hey, how are you? I'm Molly. I played tennis, taught a little bit. I, you have a court here at the property, don't you? And she said, oh, yeah, we do. She, it's great. We have a tennis pro. He teaches every Tuesday night to anybody that wants to come. And I said, wow. I said, man, I would love to, you know, talk to you about teaching here. If anything ever changes with him, you know, let me know, right? And she goes, oh, yeah, no, no, no. He's been here for six years. He's unbelievable. Everybody loves him, right? We're good. So I hand her my just bootleg business card. You know what I mean? The paper thin. You know, when you were 20, did you do that, right? But you're so excited because you can be a grown-up and you have a business card. So I hand her my business card and I said, well, if anything changes, let me know. And she said, no, 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 I appreciate it, but we're good. I get back in my car, I'm driving back to my friend's apartment. And as I'm driving, I see this little, probably like a local place, because it's just a sort of a local knockoff pizza place called Pero's Pizza. So I see Pero's Pizza and I think, you know, that's right across the street. I wonder if that place sells a lot of pizza to that apartment complex. So I thought, what the heck? So I pull up and I walked in and I said, is Mr. or Mrs. Pero here? Pretty safe bet, right? Pero's Pizza, Pero, right? So out comes Mr. Pero. I said, Mr. Pero. He said, yeah. I said, hey, man, there's this apartment complex right across the street. I said, they've got like 1,100 un units over there. I said, do you sell a lot of pizza to that apartment complex? He said, well, a, a little bit, but not a ton. And I said, God, man, it's right there. It just feels like you should be driving back and forth, you know, selling pizza all day, right? <coughs> he said, yeah, wow, that's great. It's right there. And I said, well, what if we did something where, I don't know, once a month, you give me like 15 or 20 pizzas for free. And in exchange, I'll give them to all the residents that come to the tennis clinic, get them excited about Perro's Pizza. I can take a coupon from Perro's, put it in the newsletter that the residents get. We can drive traffic back to Perro's. He goes, I love it. That's great. 15, 20 free pizzas a month, and you'll stuff the newsletter with it. I said, yeah. He said, wow, I love it. I said, okay, but Mr. Perro, the thing is, I don't have a deal over there yet, but I'm really close. So when I get it, right, I'll be back. He said, well, I like it. I said, I know, man, I got it. I got it. I'll be back. I get back in my car. I got, drive back to my friend's apartment. And I called my buddies at Wilson Sporting Goods that gave me tennis rackets in college. I said, hey, Rick, I'm trying to get this deal to teach tennis for a little bit off my rent. I said, do you have a bunch of stuff like water bottles, keychains, T-shirts, a bunch of Wilson goodies? He said, yeah. Can you put that in a box and send it down to me? I'm trying to get this deal to teach tennis. He said, Don, no problem. I'll take care of it. I'll get it down there later this week. It'll be there early next week. I said, Rick, yeah, so the thing is, I, I need it tomorrow. I mean, FedEx is fine. Afternoon delivery is fine but I really need it tomorrow. He goes, geez, right? I said, oh, you'd be, it'd, be, it'd be great. So the next morning I wake back up. I have no job, so I go back to my favorite place, right? Kinko's. So I go back to Kinko's and I print these little tennis tips I'd made for a little magazine in Lansing on how to hit a forehand and a backhand. And I thought, you know, we could put all these tips in the newsletter to get people excited about coming to the clinic. So I print all, those stuff, all this stuff. 115, my box comes in from from Wilson. I grab my box, I drive back over to the property, I walked into the manager with my box and my tennis tips on top and I walked in, I said, hey, how are you? I'm Molly, I came by the other day, I just wanted to swing back by, you know, and check in and she goes, oh my gosh. She said, you are not going to believe this. I said, what? She said, the tennis pro came in this morning, he's getting married and he's moving out. She said, we need a tennis pro. And I was like, no. 
really? I'm like, this is amazing timing. You know what I mean? And she goes, yeah, this is incredible. I said, well, listen, you know, how did it work? What was the deal? She said, well, you know, we gave him 500 bucks off his rent and he taught tennis every Tuesday night. How much is the rent? 850. She said, so on the first of the month, he'd just write us a check for 350. I said, oh, interesting. I said, you know, this, there's this pizza place right across the street. These guys are really cool. I said, they will hook us up with free pizzas once a month. And in exchange for that, I can stuff the newsletters with a coupon to drive traffic back to Peros. I said, these guys at Wilson are great. We can give some of this stuff away periodically. You know, we could put these tennis tips in the newsletter. And she goes, man, this is awesome. I love it. I love it. I, I love it. I said, yeah, you know, this 850, 500, 350 thing, you know, I mean, why don't we just wave it, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's cleaner, you know, it's easier. She's like, what? I said, yeah, let's just wave it. I'll move in. We keep the momentum going, you know? <coughs> She's like, well, I got to cold call my boss and see if, you know, I can get that done. I said, yeah, no, I'm cool. <laughs> I have no job. I'll wait, right? She walks back. She comes out like five minutes later. She said, you're not going to believe this. She said, I told him about this Wilson stuff and these tennis tips and this Peros deal. You are good to go. She said, in fact, we'd love you to move in as soon as possible. So I lived in this little one-bedroom apartment for nine years for free, right? It was awesome. I tell you that story, though, because to me, I think when we think about being fearless at work, it means we've got to be resilient, right? We're going to get, no, it's okay, we got to recover. we got to be able to stay curious so that we can recognize that through that curiosity, we grow. And through that growth, we can do magical things. Smoltz made his career last even longer because he embraced that change. Because he traded defensiveness or change for curiosity. And you know what's so cool? As leaders inside your organization, the best thing is it's about a choice that's up to you. To me, it's all about a choice that we make. It's a mindset. It's a shift in ourselves to say, I'm going to take ownership. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to be resilient. And most of all, I'm going to have the courage to be bold. And when we do that, we can be fearless at work. And most importantly, we can help those around us be fearless in the work that they do. Thank you so much. It's fun to be with all of you.